Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now in the to the first of the 11 poems of Sea Drift in Leaves of Grass, the poem Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking. Hey you guys, I am very excited and can I say a little bit afraid uh, to uh, work this poem with you. Um, of all the poems in Leaves of Grass, I think I commented on this in my intro comments to uh, the Sea Drift section, this is one of those poems that I think has to be read out loud, but I have to be honest, I'm not always totally sure how to do it the right way. And I don't really, I think there is a right way to do it, and yet I'm a little bit intrepid here as I step into this, and I think that's a good thing. I think this is a poem that deserves a little bit of reverence. Some have qualified this as one of the most demanding poems in all of Leaves of Grass. I think along with Lilacs, certainly that is the case. We'll make the argument that we learn to read th this poem so that we can read uh, Lilacs Last and the Doyer Bloom later in our study together. Um, this is, for many people, myself included, one of the reasons why we love Leaves of Grass so much. What Whitman pulls off here is stunning in his ability to capture nuance and rhythm. Uh, in a article that maybe he wrote about this poem himself, he called it a curious warble. Of course, warbling echoes is the actual, the actual line here. Now, our assumption is that you've been with us all the way from the very beginning at LearnStrong.net down that left-hand side. Our talks with Walt, we are calling uh, this uh, set of comments and this set of archives. And I think that's the right title when I come to a poem like this. I mean, I was trying to think about, what do I call uh, this? This set of archives over every poem of the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. It's obviously a, a, a pretty, uh, you know, uh, serious enterprise to try and talk over every one of the poems. And I like the idea of talks with Walt because it is a conversation. We're going to have an interesting kind of dialogue or conversation that will happen here. Now, uh, if you've been with us from the very beginning of inscriptions all the way through, starting from Pominock, we're going to get Pominock in a couple of times in this poem mentioned, um, all the way up to, and I'm hoping that you've watched my introduction to the Sea Drift poems, the collection of the 11 poems. Um, and as always, we're going to turn now to our Nortons to get a little bit of background information here. Um, uh, we're told that this poem, first published under the title of A Child's Remembrance in the Christmas number, December 24th, 1859, of the New York Saturday Press, whose editor, Henry Clapp, was Whitman's friend and companion in the uh, Pfaff restaurant courtier that we've talked about elsewhere. The long poem, called Preverse, syntactically a single sentence, was followed by reminiscence in 35 numbered stanzas. With concurrent revisions, the poem appeared prominently in all Leaves of Grass or Passage Dandy editions. The present authorized text appeared in Leaves of Grass 1881. The revisions of 1860 merit close study, while those of 1867 greatly improved the phrasing. In Leaves of Grass 1860 and 67, the title was a word out of the sea. Under its present title, it headed the Seashore Memories Group in Passage Tandy in 1871 and until that supplement was consolidated with Leaves of Grass in 1881. Whitman himself probably wrote the editorial notice of the poem in the same issue of the Saturday Press, quote, Our readers may, if they choose, consider as our Christmas or New Year's present to them the curious warble by Walt Whitman of a child's reminiscence on our first page. Like the leaves of grass, the purport of this wild and plaintive song, well-enveloped and eluding definition is positive and unquestionable, like the effect of music. The, the piece will bear reading many times, perhaps indeed only comes forth as from recesses, by many repetitions, in quote. I, I like the fact that he says the effect of music, and the word aria will get used, and there have been scholars that have commented on, and we've mentioned this already, uh, um, um, the, the, the influence of opera on Whitman. In All About a Mockingbird, Saturday Press, January 7th, 1860, Whitman defended this poem against the charge in the Cincinnati Daily Commercial, December the 28th, 1859, that the poem is meaningless. So right from the start, this is one of the poems of Leaves of Grass that just sent lots of people over the edge. They were like, what is going on in this poem? The poem 
now that now that continue with Norton's. The poem is profoundly autobiographical in that its theme goes to the very center of the poet's experience, how he became a poet, and how his songs awoke. So a poetic epiphany will be what we're witnessing in this poem. Whether or not it's based on a personal loss is not known, but surely its interpretation of love and death relates to the Calamus themes. Um, Helen Price recalled that Whitman had read it to her family as early as 1858. Swinburne, who we've commented on, uh, the great um, theophysist, the, the great spiritual thinker, called it, quote, the most lovely and wonderful thing I've read for years and years, and there is such beautiful skill and subtle power in every word of it, end quote. Um, the the, the uh, challenge now of reading this poem is how to actually read it. Because of the length of the poem, I'm not going to read it in its entirety, start to finish, although I have to admit, I, 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 that's what I originally was going to do, but it would take this conversation uh, far too long. However, when you look at the poem, you do recognize 10 designations of differences or movements. Can I call them movements? I will. I'll call them 10 movements. And so I will read each of the 10 movements and then I will, uh, I will uh, discuss as we go. By the way, just to remind you, Sea Drift is the title of this section of poems. And you'll remember that the word drift gets used in Shut Not Your Doors early on in Leaves of Grass. Um, um, the, one uh, words of my book, nothing, uh, the, he'll say it this way, the words of my book, nothing, the drift of it, everything. So this idea of drift, the notion, catching something is, is, is significant. And you'll maybe remember that the word cradle does get used one time in Leaves of Grass in Song of Myself, Passage 8, the little one sleeps in its cradle. I think this is a, a compelling image as well. By the way, just notice all the prepositions as we read now the first section. Out of the cradle, endlessly rocking, out of the mockingbird's throat, the musical shuttle out of the ninth month midnight, over the sterile sands and the fields beyond where the child leaving his bed wandered alone, bareheaded, barefoot, down from the showered halo, up from the mystic play of shadows twining and twisting as if they were alive, out from the patches of briars and blackberries, from the memories of the bird that chanted to me, from your memories, sad brother, from the fitful risings and fallings, I heard from under that yellow half-moon late risen and swollen as if with tears, from those beginning notes of yearning and love there in the midst, from the thousand responses of my heart never to cease, from the myriad fence-aroused words, from the words stronger and more delicious than any, from such as now, they start the scene revisiting. As a flock, twittering, rising, or overhead, passing, born, hither, air, all eludes me, hurriedly, a man, yet by these tears, a little boy again, throwing myself on the sand, confronting the waves, I, chanter of pains and joys, uniter of here and hereafter, taking all hints to use them, but swiftly leaping beyond them, a reminiscence, sing. Now, let's just point out really quickly that in some ways we're going to see the birth of Whitman as poet here. You'll remember that we said there's five P's that we look at. Poet is just one of them. Whitman is person, pedagogue, or teacher, politician, and philosopher. And we're going to see this philosopher a lot in, in this poem as well, as I said in my introductory comments to Cedra. These Voices that we're going to hear, and we're already set up for them in this first notice. It's a single long sentence, this first passage I read. The four B's, as I call it, when I talk about this poem. The voices of the bird, the boy, the bard, or, or, or the man, Whitman, and the brine, that is to say, the sea. It's just an easy way for us to remember the four B's of this poem. This is one of the great read-aloud poems, especially because we're going to see throughout the poem you have this dance between the dactylic and the trochaic meters, which will um, kind of play like like movement of waves, which will uh, which I think will will help us. Now we started with prep with prepositions, and we've seen this already in Lisa Grass, that especially in Song of Myself, that this kind of thing matters. Notice we're out of the cradle, endlessly rocking. We'll get to what that's all about later. Out of the Mockingbird's Throat, we're going to ask about the birth of To Kill a Mockingbird, Harper Lee's classic novel in this 
possibly in this we'll get to, we'll get to it when we um, when we meet passage uh, number two here in a second. Um, the musical shuttle. Um, by the way, this is the only use of the word shuttle in all of Leaves of Grass, which I find fascinating. But I also love the, um, the fact that, do you remember in, the, in, in, in our conversation at LearnStrong.net, we've given full lectures over the Odyssey. And you'll remember that I commented as I was working through that epic poem that weaving is, is a central motif. You'll remember Penelope at her shuttle, right, trying to weave that, um, you know, that... that, um, that picture, that, uh, that shroud, that burial shroud, and then undoing it at night, of course. And we talked about how the poet is constantly weaving. Here, I think Whitman is playing a similar kind of game. As for the word rocking, you'll maybe remember this one in uh, the poem, um, our old foulage, um water uh, rocking silently, and that echoing comes back. Out of the ninth month, which is this Quaker use of September, think about how nine months September plays the game as well, possibly the human cycle, that is to say, from um, uh, the from from fertilization and fertility to finally birth, and then notice in the next line we've got sterile sands. So we've got this interesting dynamic already happening over the sterile sands and the fields beyond. Where the child leaving, there was a child went forth. Will be one of the famous poems about children, of course. Song of myself, passage six. A child ask, uh, you know, what is the grass fetching it to me? Here you've got a child, his bed wandered alone. So we got more of this Odyssey's journeying stuff going on. And then the word alone we're going to come back to several times in, in this, in this uh, uh, poem. Bareheaded and barefoot is going to be mentioned several times. In other words, without protection, we might say, so we might say innocent. Down from the showered halo, it's used two times and only two times in Leaves of Grass, and it happens in this poem, the use of the word halo. Up from the majestic play, we've already seen, um, uh, I'm sorry, from the mystic play, we've already seen mystic used several times in Leaves of Grass. There's shadows twining and twisting. Think about Leaves of Grass as a great title where it plays with these two words. As if they were alive, the power of nature. In other words, out from the patches of briars and blackberries, in other words, coming out of nature, from the memories of the bird that chanted to me. So you've got this really interesting dynamic of birds singing. We can't think of this without thinking of St. Francis of Assisi, um, of course, preaching to the birds, but probably Eckhart Tolle is right. He was probably being preached to uh, by the birds, right? From your memories sad brother. That, now, the, the identification with, of, the, with, of the bird as being a brother, and later we're going to get to mothers, is going to be significant. From the fitful risings and fallings, again, aria will be used later, I heard from, by the way, nine of these from, right, from under that yellow half moon, late risen, notice stacked together, four words uh, and, and the two pairs hyphenated, um, late risen and swollen, as if with tears. It's an interesting simile, and, um, uh, and, and poem number three of Seadrift is in fact just simply called Tears. From those beginning notes of yearning and love there in the midst, of course, yearning, and, and you get a lot of sexual language throughout this poem like this. In the midst, you'll remember, rise to me in the midst of the sea dash with the hair. Remember all of that from Song of Myself 46. From the thousand responses, we're going to get the numbers and the numbers game here in a, in a bit. Uh, responses of my heart, never to cease, that is to say endlessly, right? Hoping, hoping never to cease or lie by again, he says in Song of Myself, passage one. From the myriad fenced aroused words, again, more sexual language with the aroused. From the words stronger and more delicious than any. We'll pay attention three times the word delicious gets used in really interesting and strange ways in this poem. From such as now they start the scene revisiting, which is what all great poets in the end will do, right? Remember, it will be um, um, Wordsworth who argues, right, in his Lyrical Ballads, that preface that we've lectured on elsewhere at LearnStrong.net, um, emotions recollected in tranquility, this revisiting as a flock twittering, rising or overhead, passing, born hither, ere all eludes me, hurriedly a man by these tears a little boy again so it's going to be this poet the 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 great the great bard the the great chanter of these songs is going back to an image a time when as a child there he was but notice throwing myself on the sand confronting the waves we think of byron and child harold's pilgrimage apostrophe to the ocean i 
chanter of pains and joys. Again, we're going to see both sides of the yin-yang symbol for the Taoists in the house. Uniter of here and hereafter, exactly what all great artists do. They bring that uniting. Taking all hints to use them, but swiftly leaping beyond them. Again, transcend and include a reminiscence scene. If, if some of you are going, wait, 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 where did I, where, reminiscence, you're right, in Cabin Ships at Sea, right at the beginning of Leaves of Grass, we're going to get this word reminiscence, which is so much of what Whitman is and does. Now, the second passage is just going to follow up on the first, and some will see the first and the second is almost like an introduction. He says it this way, once Pominock, you'll remember this is the Native American for Long Island, a childhood memories all come back for Pominock. Of course, starting from Pominock is a set of lines that we've already messed with and we'll point out at the conclusion of starting from Pominock, remember that use of the word O oh, again and again in the 19th passage that we point out, oh, 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 we're going to see that game played out here again. Once, Pominock. When the lilac scent was in the air, and I told you guys, um, we're going we're gonna to play around with lilacs all the way through, um, but we're going to come to it in its full fruition. Maybe the greatest poem in all the leaves of grass, when lilacs last in the door to bloom. We'll learn how to read that poem by starting here with this poem. So let's read now the second passage. Once Pominock, when the lilac scent was in the air and the fifth month grass was growing, up this seashore and some briars, two feathered guests from Alabama, two together in their nest, and Four light green eggs spotted with brown, and every day the he-bird to and fro near at hand, and every day the she-bird crouched on her nest, silent with bright eyes, and every day I, a curious boy, never too close, never disturbing them, cautiously peering, absorbing, translating. Now, we mentioned about Pominock already. When the lilac scent was in the air in the fifth month, that is to say May, of course, uh, grass was growing. And again, I told you about his use of the word grass and the idea that um, everything is about growth in leaves of grass. Up this seashore, I love the word this, that is to say he wants you there with him now. In some briars, we've seen briars and blackberries already. Two feathered guests from Alabama. And I said, maybe this is the birth of Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. Two together. We're going to get two together in the third passage when we begin for the first time with the singing aria of the birds themselves. And their nest. Notice the repetition, five of them with the word and. And their nest. And the four light green, notice hyphened. Eggs spotted with brown. You'll remember this, uh, this word spotted uh, for those of you who are like, Where? I know I've heard this. Right, Song of Myself, Passage 52, only there it was a, the, 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 the spotted hawk, right, um, um, uh, it, with the barbaric yop. But the amazing eye, and notice the use of colors in this poem. And every day, the Hebrew to and fro near at hand, and every day, the she-bird, again, already the rhythms, right, uh, crouched on her nest, Silent, we're going to get to this whole thing of silence versus chanting with bright eyes and every day I, and then a curious boy. I think the word curious, like the word silent, are both key words in this poem. So you, you decide how you want to read it. Notice he says, never too close, never disturbing them. In other words, there's always for Whitman the need for the proper distance. Can we just say it that way? And that's what great writers and artists always do. We may not fully agree with them, but they're always going to at least try to demonstrate to us a certain kind of proximity without disturbing, right? And then cautiously, I think this is what, here we get three words of what all great artists do. Peering, absorbing, translating, the great poet tells us this is what, I mean, think of it. This is what Shakespeare does. This is what Milton does. This is what Emily Dickinson does. This is what all the great writers do. They have this tendency to want to see, peer, to absorb, take in, and then somehow to translate, that is to say, to transcend and include. That's what evolution is. That's what evolution does. And for those of us that have been reading all of Leaves of Grass to this point, we might pause and smile and say, you know what, that's kind of like Whitman has done. It's kind of amazing how he's played that game. Now, before we meet the third passage, which is a strange little interlude passage, and it, of course, is offset almost always with italics because we're going to get a sense that there's something else going on here. And, of course, the idea is this 
is going to be the song of the bird, okay? And we're going to immediately think of Shelley Skylark. But let's, for a moment, pause uh, with, um, with our Nortons, just to point out, with this repetition of the word shine, shine, shine. Um, Norton says, comparison with earlier versions shows Whitman's success in improving the lyrics, now printed in italics, which resemble birdsong, especially the characteristic reiteration of phrase, the varied vocalic modulation of the cadences, and the staccato twittering accentuation um, in these lines. Now, there's any number of ways that I have played with these lines that are italicized. As I think I said in my earlier lecture introducing Seadrift, as I raised my children, I would read this poem often for them at the park or go before going to night-night bed. And I found that over the years I would play with different voices. And one of the voices that I noticed, they grew qu quiet. And, you know, I remember even once because they were just playing and I was just reading it aloud. And two of them just stopped and kind of came over and sat down because I started from my normal reading voice. I went not to song, which is, it can be song, and many readers of this will sing uh, this like, shine, 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 and they'll play that game. But I went to whispering because the poem itself uses the word whispering. So I will now read this third brief section to set us up for sections five, seven, uh, here in a little bit. I will read today this passage and the passages to follow that are set off in italicies, the whispering. Shine, shine, shine. Pour down your warmth, great sun, while we bask, we two together, two together. Winds blow south or winds blow north, Day come white or night come black, home or rivers and mountains from home, singing all time, minding no time, while we too keep 